Garrett, if you'd like to put your hands together for your entertainment manager, Matt Bacon. Good morning, everybody. How are we all? Did we sleep well? Yes. Lovely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is, of course, that time. So please put your hands together for the lady of the hour. It's the lovely Leslie Garrett. You offered her a whiskey? It's true. Is it true? Yes, but I didn't partake. <laughs> <laughs> so, we take, we've t taken in all of your questions, so we're going to try and get through as many as we can. There's a lot. There is a lot. Ooh. So, question number one is from Colin Whithall. Hello, Colin. Hello. Hello. Uh, he asks, how do you keep to the high standards um, is it continuous training after so long, or do you just only need a top up? <laughs> What's a top up? Could be sound like, like a pint of milk. I know, yeah. <laughs> it is continuous training, actually, Colin. I'm very grateful to you for asking this question uh, because it's uh, something I'm quite passionate about. Uh, and I, I talk to uh, young singers about this all the time. Uh, I think the reason, the sole reason, um, apart from you know the, the fact that you all seem to still like to hear me sing, the sole reason I was going to say that I'm still going is that I have singing lessons every week uh, with my uh, singing teacher, my dear friend, uh, Joy, Joy Mammon. I discovered Joy at the Royal Academy of Music uh, back in 1978, uh, and we've been together ever since. And I had a, a singing lesson actually just the day before yesterday before I came here. It's a bit like having a sort of personal fitness trainer for the voice. And she puts me through my paces and keeps my voice stretched and keeps the, the muscles that govern the voice in, uh, in a fit and in good, in good shape. Uh, because I think it's like, it's like any physical activity. Um, you know, if you, if you don't use it, you lose it. It's true, isn't it, of everything you do. If it's gardening, you know. Uh, and I just keep exercising and training all the time. And, because I, 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 I attempt such a wide range of different kinds of music as well, um, it, I need to be particularly vocally fit to do that. Uh, you know, because, you know, it, although my, the, the voice is the same, different composers require different things from my voice. Um, whether that's um, a popular composer, you know, Andrew Lloyd Webber, or one of the, the composers of uh, music theatre, or whether it's Bach. Uh, you know, I would never sing Bach in the same way as I sing Puccini, you know, so why would I sing Lloyd Webber in the same way I sing Schubert? So, you know, I have to find the right sound for that composer, and that requires continuous training. Uh, because the thing about being a singer is that you never uh, hear your voice as others do. I mean, I, I'm sure you've all experienced this when you've heard yourself uh, on a recording, just speaking, you think, oh, what's that, don't you? Well, it's, it's multiplied a hundredfold for a singer. Um, we just, our perception of our sound is completely different from, from your perception of my sound. So, uh, for that reason, I think we continually need, uh, need another pair of ears, whether it's a coach or a singing teacher, or in my case, both, um, to, to tell us if what we think we're doing is, not, is in actual fact what is being received by by the audience. So, um, for all those reasons, it's absolutely vital to continue training. And also, because I've not got to my peak yet, I'm still improving. <laughs> so, what's that the corner? Thank you. Fantastic. Right, so the next question's from Jean Clark. Jean Clark. Oh, hello, Jean. Oh, that was the comment. That was good. Yes. We're going along the line. There we go. <laughs> so, Oh, well, that's all right. I'll still speak to you. I'll make an exception. <laughs> um, so this question is, um, how do you obtain your opera parts? Um, are you chosen or do you, you or your manager have to apply for those? That's, that's a very good question. Um, well, it, it's changed over the years. Um, in the early days, I would audition and if I was good enough, I'd get the part. Uh, once I got to the English National Opera, once I became a principal soprano there in 1984, then they chose my parts for me. 
uh, usually in consultation, but we'd, we'd have a chat about what I was hoping to do, and they'd say, you know, don't be ridiculous, do Mozart, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> not in this house, dear, too big. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, since uh, I've become a bit, a bit older, um, I think things things change. When for a, a kind, the kind of soprano I am, which is a, a, a sort of fairly light lyric soprano, um, the the category of roles that I am considered to be suitable for, which is is known as my fach. I don't know if you've heard that expression. It's a German expression, F A C H. Um, uh, has my fach has changed because most of the parts that um, that I would. Uh, have done in my early career um, tended to be for for young sopranos, sopranos of my age, and it's a bit of a problem actually for older sopranos because there, there are no roles written for us. Um, that's that's if you want to know historically why that is, it's because well, it's, it's a couple of reasons. First of all, sopranos traditionally lost the top thirds of their voices. Uh, well, after the menopause, to be honest, it's. A, a physical thing that happens to, to, to female singers, that you lose the top of your voice. <laughs> but that doesn't happen these days because of the miracle of HRT, ladies. So we, we sopranos are now carrying on, you know, as you hopefully heard last night, and the tops of our voices, you know, are, are not deteriorating. So we are struggling now because um, historically, uh, composers didn't write roles for, for our age group. Um, I think the other reason is that, historically, um, women didn't have much power once they were past childbearing age, so they weren't interesting characters for, uh, for, for composers to write for, unless you were a queen or something, I suppose. Um, so all of that has changed, so I'm, I've kind of thrown out a bit of a challenge to, to young composers to you know, say, look, if you want opera to... Uh, represent contemporary society um, in order that opera should therefore be seen as a contemporary art form, you need to write for what's going on now. You need to write for powerful older women because, you know, we're now, we're, you know, we're running countries, we're captains of industry, so these things need to be reflected if, uh, if you want opera to be seen as a, a modern art form. So um, I'm kind of in the process of encouraging some young composers to write for me. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I've got a, a new agent for opera, and he is very creative, and he is now in discussion with um, the opera companies of this country uh, to try and see if some of the roles that uh, traditionally are done by younger sopranos could actually be done by older ones. Um, and I'm uh, very pleased to be able to tell you that um, this time next year, in the Garsington Festival, um, I don't know if you've heard of this, it's a wonderful opera festival near Oxford. I'm going to be um, reprising my role as uh, Despina in Così Fan Tutte. Um, so I hope some of you might come to that because there's nothing in that opera that says that Despina has to be any particular age at all. So um, I'm going to be able to perform her again and I'm very excited about that. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, it's uh, Yes, it's, it's complicated now, but I'm getting there. I'm back in opera, and that's the main thing. <laughs> okay. okay, next question is from Steve Down. Steve Down. Hi, Steve. Now, I have to just tell you, Steve and Lynn Down are um, very precious people to me because they run my Leslie Garrett fan club. Oh. Yes which I want to just quickly tell you about, in case any of you fancy joining them, please don't think you have to, but we do have the best fun. It's a proper club, and my, my fans, who are my friends now, come to nearly everything I do, and we always have a get-together afterwards, and we have lots of fun. Uh, and we have, you know, I do a, um, a newsletter, quarterly newsletter, and we send out photographs, and we have a, a lovely, lovely site, uh, an interactive site, and it's, it's a lot of fun. So if any of you want in, uh, any information about that, Steve's at the back there, and Lynn, um, and uh, you know, I would encourage you because we do have a lot of fun. I know some of you probably are already members, um, but what was Steve's question? I can't Steve. believe there's anything you can think to ask me that you don't know already, love. <laughs> Steve's question was, um, after spending seven years at the Royal Academy of Music, um, what do you think of this instant stardom shows like X Factor, The Voice, where it's got talent, things oh, like that? That's interesting, isn't it? What do you all think of these programmes? Maybe I should throw it back to you. Oh. 
There's thumbs down over there. Okay, thumbs up? No, a couple of thumbs up, thumbs down? Oh, mostly thumbs down, that's interesting. Well, it's, it's, some, it's worthy of debate, isn't it? Um, I've kind of got a foot in both camps, really. Because I think we, it, the tradition of the talent competition in this country is nothing new, is it? We've always had talent competitions. Um, and I, I, what I love is that there are so many people, and always have been in this country, that uh, are incredibly talented and I want to share that. Uh, you know, it, it's wonderful to see people, I think, step up onto a stage and give it a go. Because I'm a bit of a give it a go girl myself, you know. So, and I entered competitions when I was, um, you know, um, in my teens. Festivals, a lot of festivals. Uh, which, you know, I know were a little bit different, um, but nonetheless it was an opportunity to, dis to, to display talent and to, to um, gain experience of performing in public and hopefully be seen and be snapped up. And, you know, people always have been snapped up. It's, it's nothing new. What's new now, I suppose, is the fact it can be done on television and as the with the advent of the famous Mr. Cowell, Santa Cowell, yeah. people can be plucked from obscurity and catapulted into mega fame, you know, before they've blinked. Uh, which I think can be a little bit dangerous. Um, because and and it's tricky because obviously I've got a lot of friends and colleagues and young people who I meet at the Royal Academy. I'm um, uh, I'm one of the uh, board members there, and I'm involved in, in, with the Royal Academy. And you know, these kids are training and and, have, and, ra and raising funds to be able to train, and uh, you know, and, and working really hard. And many of them won't get anywhere because they won't have the chance to be picked from obscurity in that way, unless they, I suppose, enter the competition, which is the other option. So, what what do you particularly not like about what what, what do you not like about them? Yes. The process. Mm. Yes. The lady was just saying that, as we were just discussing, that uh, you know they don't have the experience of working their way through the profession. So in a way, it's it's an artificial um, success that they're experiencing. Um, so, arguably, it, you know, it won't sustain. Uh, it's artificial, basically, isn't it, I suppose? But, I don't know, it's, um, I'm in two minds about it myself, so it's interesting to hear your views. It is a tricky one, because, like, talking, I did a performing arts degree, and a lot of my classmates are finding it very hard to get jobs within the industry because of shows like that. And if you don't kind of go for those kind of shows, you're not getting the kind of breaks, because a lot of, like, um, casting directors are going for names instead of trying to get new new faces and kind of new names within like the musical theatre kind of industry. So but isn't it in a way but just it, a glorified audition process? It, it, is, it, it, it does get people is. noticed, doesn't but, it? And it is a great way for a lot of new faces to actually get, because a lot of the people on Britain's Got Talent, like Steve Hewlett, um, he actually did the Warner circuit before he did Britain's Got Talent. And now because of Britain's Got Talent, He's now doing star breaks, he's doing tours. It's kind of given him that opportunity to bump up his, uh, his opportunity. Like I've got friends who've been only in the semi-finals and kind of stuff like that. And luckily now because of that, they're getting tours with local holiday companies. They're getting jobs with like Thompson's abroad on cruise ships and all that kind of stuff. So and they've got spotted. Yeah, it's been, spotted. It's, been given, it's given them the opportunity to get spotted. and. I understand why it does have a downside, but then of course it has helped a lot of people who were actually already in the industry actually get that next step up and to kind of keep continuously doing what they do. And sometimes it, it, it works in reverse. I, do you like The Voice? Mm -hmm. yeah. You see, that's, I think that's a really interesting programme. I do like The Voice. Um, but Leia Jones auditioned for that, didn't yeah. she? Who was uh, had a huge success in hairspray, and she didn't get picked. Yeah. So that's that's probably the end of her, I'm afraid. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree, Matt? Yeah, so definitely. it's a really interesting question, and and I'll be interested to hear your views on that because uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not easy in this profession. So yeah. you know, any opportunity people get to show what they can do, they're going to grab it. Definitely. I don't really blame them. Yeah, true. Here we go. Next one. Uh, is it Vera Whitehouse? Hello, Vera. Vera. Hello. Um, she wants to know, how old were you when you first started uh, singing and who gave you your first break? Thank you, Vera. I actually can't remember not singing. 
I really can't. Are you laughing, man? Were you one of those lovely kids that just kept humming along? Yeah, I, I just fun. loved singing. Oh, it was kind of how I expressed who I was. It, it was. This is why I, I think I'm going to so struggle to keep it up because it's not what I do; it's who I am. You know, and it always has been. I, I honestly can't remember when I wasn't making noise. <laughs> And I always, I used to talk a huge amount as well, funny. Um, in fact, my, don't tell anybody, but my nickname was Gobby Garrett when I was in school. It's true. We like that, don't we, Matt? Uh, but, I, but I think it's to do with communication. I just do love communicating. Because I think that's the other side of the, of, well, it's probably the same, two sides of the same side in a way. Uh, it's one thing to have a voice and a, you know, and a,